I grew up on Long Island, right outside of Kings Park Psychiatric Center, home of the legend of Cropsy. I was always a good kid, never broke any rules, never really pushed the limits of what was and what wasn't allowed. But recently I moved home after graduating college and just started looking for a job in New York City. Throughout my college years, I struggled with anxiety and depression, which led me to being medicated to control it. Through this entire ordeal, all I could think about was the poor children of Kings Park and what they must have gone through. Some of them just had anxiety, a common ailment in today's society, and one that is completely manageable. And yet, they were stuffed inside an insane asylum, which was over capacity by 1,000 people, treated like animals. This revelation that I got extremely lucky has always been on my mind. If I had been born just a couple decades earlier and in the same area, who knows what may have happened to me. On the hinges of self-awareness, I decided to break the rules for once in my life. I had to visit Kings Park and see what it was for myself. For those of you who don't live in the New York area, Kings Park has a gate around it. It's situated in the middle of the wood area, but it's not like there are guards and an electric fence or anything. It's private property, so you're not supposed to trespass, but I can say that almost my entire high school did go anyway. But I never did. I was always too terrified of the legends, and of Cropsy in particular. I'll tell the story of Cropsy quickly because it's relevant to the history but not really relevant to this story. Cropsy was a legend that popped up in the Long Island area, saying that one of the patients from Kings Park had escaped and was killing people in the woods around the old hospital. Only part of this was true. There was someone killing young and mostly disabled children around the hospital, but it wasn't an escaped patient. It was an old ward of the hospital that was living in the tunnels and bunkers underneath the hospital. There's a really great Netflix documentary on the whole story if you're interested. Since the legend of Cropsy turned out to be based on truth, I decided this was something I didn't want to mess with. King's Point would just be another broken down building in the area whose memory would pop into my head at weird times. This all changed after college and my diagnosis though. I know I wasn't diagnosed with anything heavy, but I still feel a sense of responsibility, or the camaraderie of a sort, and had to see what they experienced. So, one night around 7.30pm, I headed towards Kings Park with a flashlight, a backpack, and a water bottle. I figured I wasn't going to need anything else, but I did have a small hunting knife with me in my pocket, just in case. I got to the broken down foundations of the psychiatric hospital that tortured so many innocent children, and I couldn't find the strength to do anything more than just stare up at the walls. This thing was truly massive. If you haven't seen it, it's got about 15 floors, and it just goes straight up. I decided to push myself into the uncomfortable, and I found a window on the ground floor that was open. I climbed up into it. I will say in hindsight that it was stupid of me to go alone, but I had to do this for myself. It was something that I was conquering, or so I thought in my head. As I wandered aimlessly around the corridors, looking at all of the graffiti on the walls, seeing the broken down bed frames with rusty metal and fingernail claw marks on what left of the doors, I got real chills. For some reason, I felt particularly drawn to the third floor. I can't really explain what it was, but my feet just moved on their own, toward this one spot on the third floor of the abandoned hospital. There really wasn't anything special about it. It was just a hallway outside of a couple of rooms near a communal bathroom. But since I was there, I looked around. I smelled the stale musk of an abandoned building and scanned the exposed brick with my eyes. As I was looking through the shattered drywall to the exposed brick beyond, I caught a glimpse of a spot that was just slightly darker than the rest of the brick and mortar. 
Intrigued, I moved closer and shined my flashlight right onto the dark spot. With a little poking and prodding and the removal of an even more drywall, I was able to fish it free. A small, string-bound diary made entirely out of loose leaf paper. There was a cover, so to speak, so I was able to be folded up nicely and neatly and tucked away into the empty brick space behind the wall. My curiosity, though, was piqued, but I wasn't dumb enough to start reading it right then and there. It was dark, and I was still inside a supposedly haunted asylum. I took one last look around the place, made peace with myself and the patience of the building, and went home. As soon as I got home, I took a shower to rinse whatever was left of Kings Park. I opened my backpack to retrieve that diary. It seems to be the diary of a young girl who was put into the hospital back when it was in operation. I figured I'd write down the first entry here, and I'll share the remainder in the next couple of days. April 24th, 1918 It is my first day here. Mama told me to keep track of the days and who I am so I don't forget. I am Florence Blackwell, and I am 10. Mama and Daddy made me come here to the hospital to get better. They said I was sick, and that's why I wet the bed at night. Daddy said that once I get better, the other girls in town will still want to play with me. Mama was sad when she dropped me off. She had tears in her eyes like she was going to cry. But I told her, don't be sad, Mama. I'm going to get better for you. And the nice lady in the nurse hat took me inside the hospital while Mama cried outside. I don't know why Mama was so upset. Daddy was happy to see me go to the hospital to get better. The lady who took me in the hospital said her name was Nurse Wilson, but that I can call her Mary. Mama and Daddy always told me never to call an adult by their real names, but I think I'll call her Mary. She's nice to me, not like that doctor. I don't remember his name, but the doctor was not nice. Mary brought me into a big white room in the hospital and asked me to take off all my clothes so I can put on a big white gown and the doctor can take a look at me. Mary helped me out of my dress that my mama made me and made me stand in the middle of the white room with a vent on the floor. Then Mary left and the doctor man came in. Or at least I think he was a doctor. He told me to stand with my arms out just like a starfish and to close my eyes and hold my breath. Then he took out a giant hose and sprayed water directly at me. I fell backwards onto the floor from how heavy that water was. He didn't stop the hose though. He kept spraying me with that heavy water on the floor of the tiled room and he didn't stop until I was crying and crying and shivering from the cold water. The doctor man stopped the hose and he told me to get up. He put on the white gown on the floor in the puddles of water and told me to wear it. I put the gown on and Mary came back in. I cried to her and she just pet my head and let me cry. Mary led me to my room where I was going to get better in the hospital. It had one bed and there were two other girls in the room already. They were both sleeping when I walked in so I didn't get to say hi to them. But Mary slipped me back into my little diary and told me to hide it so the doctor cannot find it. I was so tired I fell asleep next to the two other girls but I didn't sleep for long. In the middle of the night, I opened my eyes to see one of the other girls about three inches from my face, just staring at me while I was sleeping. She looked at me with really big eyes and a big smile on her face. And when she saw me looking at her, she turned her head to the right like a puppy and said, It's time. When she said that, someone in the hallway screamed like their daddy was hitting them with a belt. They screamed and screamed. And then someone else screamed too. And then all of the kids on the floor were screaming as loud as they could. I don't know how I'm supposed to get better with all of these kids screaming in the night. I hope they aren't hurt. But I also hope they get better so I can go home to see Mama. Mama said to write every day and remember who I am. So that is what I will do. After I read that first diary entry, scribbled in child's handwriting on a piece of loose leaf. 
I was spooked to say the least. I was actually holding a relic from a condemned insane asylum back in 1918. I immediately ran to my computer. Surely there must be some kind of record of patients put into care at King's Park. I knew it was a hospital where patients were tortured and even killed, but there should at least be some semblance of record keeping. While I could find articles labeled King's Park patient records, I couldn't find an actual list of anyone who was under the care there. Also, unfortunately, Florence Blackwell was a popular name, and Google searches of her name basically led nowhere. I figured since my modern day technology was striking out, the only way out was through, and I had to read more of the diary to get anywhere. I will admit that I was scared. I was scared to leaf through the whole thing, and I'm not reading further than I really have to. I'm terrified for little Florence and what may have happened to her and the others in that war. And the simultaneous screaming in the middle of the night? Something was up, and I wasn't really sure I wanted to know what it was. But going back to the sense of camaraderie and the duty that I felt while exploring King's Park in the first place, I felt the same sense of duty to Florence. Her story needed to be told, and her memory needs to be honored. So I kept reading. April 30th, 1918. My name is Florence Blackwell, or Patient 0724. I haven't written anything here in a while, since I have just been busy learning all the new things about the hospital. Mary comes to visit me every morning and gives me a little cup filled with four different pills. All these pills are pretty small and round and white, except for the really big one that she gives me. It's twice as big. And sometimes I accidentally cough it up when I try to swallow it. But Mary always helps me. She pets my head, gives me some water, and tells me to tilt my head back and try again. These pills always make me feel funny. It feels like my head is static on the radio. Mama always used to listen to the radio to see about the war and when daddy was going to come home. And sometimes the man on the radio would stop talking and there would just be a loud static noise coming from the radio. It was so loud Mama would scream a little if it scared her and run to the radio and turn it down so it didn't hurt my ears. I wish Mama could help me turn down the static in my head. After I get my pills in the morning, Mary brings me and my other roommate down to the main room for breakfast. This is always the scariest part of my day. There are people all over in wheelchairs, and some of them don't even know they're a person. At least that's what my roommate 0698 says. 0698 was the one who stared at my face on the first night. She's been here for two months now, and she's almost 13. She wants to get out by her 13th birthday so her daddy can take her out for a soda like a teenager. The people in wheelchairs have no hair. They stare out into space. I think they're looking at their imaginary friend, but 0698 says they're not looking at anything at all. Sometimes a little drool falls from their mouths and they don't even notice when it drips onto their laps. I had two roommates the first night I got to the hospital, but the other girl beside 0698 was brought out of our room the next morning by two large men in white jackets. She looked really scared. They grabbed her by both arms and dragged her away. I think she probably could have walked there, but they helped her anyway. That next morning at breakfast, my roommate was in a wheelchair staring out at nothing at all. She had a big bruise by her eyeball, but 0698 said to look away and pretend that we don't know her. The screaming keeps happening every night. I still don't know why everyone is screaming in the middle of the night. I am Florence Blackwell. I am 10 years old and I miss my mama. I'm going to keep writing my name so I don't forget it since no one calls me that anymore. May 3rd, 1918. I am patient 0724 or Florence Blackwell and I will be 11 years old in exactly one month. I only know that because today is a special day. When Mary came in to give me my pills this morning, she told me that today, May 3rd, 
we're going to have a special doctor come and visit us. I hope that this doctor helps me the most because I want to go home to Mama. I haven't gotten any letters from Mama or Daddy, but I hope Mama is alright. She had a couple of bruises on her face that she covered up with makeup before I left. She told me that she fell, but I hope she doesn't fall anymore when I'm not gone. I don't want her to get hurt. 0698 and I made our way down to the main hallway, where the new doctor was going to be. I was pretty tired since the screaming lasted extra long last night, and early in the morning, the two men in white jackets came in to bring me back to that room where I got blasted with water. This happens every couple of days, and I'm getting good at not falling anymore. I don't even cry when the water accidentally leaves a bruise on me. When I got to the main hall, and 0698 and I sat down while all the other nurses and doctors were up front with the patients in the wheelchairs. There was a little stage set up, and a doctor had a patient in a chair in front of him. They said this doctor's name was Dr. Freeman, and he came all the way from Pennsylvania to help us. Technically, he's still a doctor in school, he said, but I think he could be called a doctor anyway. Dr. Freeman said he was sad to see all the patients like us, being so sick and so sad, and he created a way to help us get better. He said that he was the only one who has done it so far, but it will be very popular once he graduates from doctor school. Dr. Freeman used a bunch of big words that I didn't know, but I did hear one word I recognized, brain. After a big show of Dr. Freeman talking with big words, he took up an ice pick and moved it to the head of the patient strapped down on the stage. In one motion, he shoved the ice pick into her eye and wiggled it around. I lost my breakfast right there, and Mary had to bring me back to my room. But on the way there, all I could hear were the screams and clapping. Dr. Freeman had made the patient better by hurting her? That doesn't make sense to me, but hopefully I will find out tomorrow what happened when I meet Dr. Freeman. I will be 11 in one month exactly, and I hope Dr. Freeman can make me better soon so I can go home to see my mama. After reading about Florence's latest entries, I was chilled to my core. I knew that lobotomies were a part of life at the time, and especially part of life within the mental health community. But that didn't make it less jarring to read, especially from the perspective of a 10-year-old girl. What kind of mental health facility forces its patients to sit and watch a lobotomy being performed on a man with an ice pick? This man was literally injuring people permanently for the rest of their lives and everyone thought it was great because it turns patients into a less violent type of patient. I decided to do a little bit of research on the history of lobotomies and it looks like the procedure wasn't even normalized until a couple years later, which means this entire situation was completely experimental. This man didn't have a medical license and didn't have a clue what he was doing. He was essentially just sticking a sharp object into someone's eye socket and wiggling it around until the connections between the prefrontal lobe and their brain were severed. The more I thought about the procedure being done in front of an audience, the more I wanted to lose my lunch. Before reading any further though, I wanted to do a little more research into who Florence was and if we knew who she was at all. If I couldn't find anything online, I figured there must be some kind of written record that just hadn't made its way to the internet yet. So I went to my local library. We have a historian who works there and I made an appointment and I brought Florence's diary with me for her to evaluate. I didn't want to exactly say that I found the journal while trespassing on Kings Park's grounds. So I said it was a family heirloom of sorts and I wanted to know more about who wrote it. Immediately she was intrigued, and after a little bit of ruffling through a big bookcase behind her desk, brought out a registry of people and families that lived in the area at the same time that Florence would have. This was a jump, because for as far as we know, Florence wasn't local. She could have been brought here from almost anywhere. We searched and searched the book for a birth record, or something that proved Florence existed, and we actually almost missed it. There was a small entry from 1908. 
All it said was that William and Margaret Blackwell had given birth to a baby girl, name unknown. That must have been them. It had to have been them. Sure enough, there was a World War I draft registration card for William, and there were a couple of towns over. There were too many similarities to just be a coincidence. I was convinced this had to be Florence. I'm not exactly proud of what I did next, but I stalked the Blackwell family on Ancestry.com, and let me tell you, there are hundreds of people in the Long Island area with the name Blackwell. But after a couple of sleepless nights, making the best of my college-educated research skills, I found them. With butterflies in my stomach, I sent a Facebook message to what seemed to be a family member. I am withholding names for reasons because I don't want to bother him. He's a typical old guy on Facebook, sharing memes about President Trump and clickbait ads asking for thoughts and prayers, and I really don't think he was going to answer me, but he did. William and Margaret were his great-grandparents, and their daughter Eleanor was his grandmother. She was born in 1919 and apparently had a hard life. Her father was an abusive drunk who came home with shell shock after the Great War. Her mother was too submissive to say anything and took the brunt of his anger to protect her daughter. Eleanor grew up thinking she was the oldest and only in her family. But on her mother's deathbed in 1929, when Eleanor was only 10, she confessed that Eleanor wasn't the oldest. There was a daughter before her, one with a physical deformity that William had taken most of his anger out on. This physical deformity actually makes a lot of sense in the context of the next entry she had written. She used to wet the bed, and William couldn't stand to look her in the face. Eventually, he tucked her away at a mental hospital, and that's all she knew. Margaret had never seen her daughter again. While that was a lot of information to share with a stranger through Facebook, I think it was probably the information that this man wanted to get off his chest. Imagine a family secret like that just burning a hole inside your memory. I offered to let him see the diary once I was done getting some research done and figuring out what happened, and he agreed, because he also wanted to know exactly what happened to Florence, and figured with me being a good bit younger, I knew my way around a computer in the internet. So I decided to keep plugging away and sharing Florence's story. May 4th, 1918 I met Dr. Freeman today. He kept poking my face. Usually that makes me mad. Daddy used to poke me in the face and try to make it look normal, he said. But I didn't mind when Dr. Freeman did. He was a doctor after all. Maybe he really could make me look normal so that I'd be pretty like Mama. He asked me a whole bunch of questions, like did I ever get mad, or did I ever hit Mommy and Daddy? I said of course not, I wouldn't hurt my Mama, but I think he thought I was lying. He kept writing a bunch of stuff down on his notepad. He writes way faster than me, but probably because he's an adult and he knows a lot of stuff. Dr. Freeman kept asking if I had a pet, and I told him about my bunny and how she had run away to be with her other bunny friends. But Dr. Freeman didn't seem happy about that, and wrote more stuff on his pad. He asked me if I ever started fires, and I said of course not. There was a fire down the street from my house that killed a lot of people back when I was nine. Then he asked me about my wetting the bed, and I told him that's why I was here. I had to fix my problem so that I can go home and be with Mama and Daddy, and they won't be mad at me anymore. He said that he thought I wet the bed because I was just like some other bad children he met at other hospitals, and he made me be not violent anymore. But he could do the same thing for me if I wanted. I don't think I am violent, but if Dr. Freeman says it could happen, maybe it could happen. Maybe I could turn out to be like Daddy instead of Mama. I wanted Dr. Freeman to make me better so I could go home to Mama. Yes, I am Florence. 0724. After that update, I had a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Something bad was going to happen to Florence. In my heart, I wanted to be able to hold her, to console her, and to tell her everything was okay, 
but she lived 100 years ago. She feels so real and her problems so relevant, and it's hard to believe that this happened so long ago. With a heavy heart and a stomach full of butterflies, I continued reading the journal. May 1918 I'm not sure what day today is, but I think it's May, because I don't feel 11 yet. I think if it was past my birthday, I would feel a whole year older, and I don't yet, so it can't be June. I've been really busy getting better lately. Mary comes in every morning to give me my pills, but she's got scratches on her arms, and when I ask her where they came from, she told me to take my pills. I don't know if I feel better yet, but maybe it's because we're trying new things to help me. We do the water blasting every day now, but we started a whole new thing to make me feel better. I don't wet the bed anymore, so I think I'm getting better, but Dr. Freeman says I'm not yet, so we keep doing this new thing. They take me to a big room with lots of machines and wires all over the place. In the middle of these machines is a chair. They put me in the chair and strap my arms and legs so I can't hurt myself. They then put a headband on my head and there are two circles that go on either side of my forehead. I don't really like this part because it's painful, but they turn the machine on and the circles on my head start to hurt really badly. They do this a couple of times and every time the circles hurt more and more. Sometimes I scream because it hurts, but most times I'm very brave. Usually when done, I take a wheelchair back because I'm just so sleepy and I get bruises on my forehead. Mary doesn't like it when I get this treatment. Her face goes all white and she helps me to bed with a pat on the head like she does. My roommate 0698 is gone now. I don't know where she went and no one will tell me when I ask, so I stopped asking. The screaming still happens in the middle of the night but I've seen that a lot of patients, people that were here when I came in, aren't here anymore. I don't know where they went either. For now, I'll just keep getting my treatments and hopefully mama will come get me soon. I am 0724. June 1918. Mary told me I'm 11 now. I don't know what day it is, but Mary said it's past my birthday, but I don't feel 11. I still feel 10, but I don't feel very much anymore. The painful circle treatment has been happening more and more and I'm sleeping a lot after it. Mary always comes in late at night to stroke my head and sometimes lies with me in bed when I'm asleep. Without me realizing it, I wake up beside her. Mary came into my room late tonight after everything was dark and told me she had a secret. She said I have to write everything down in my diary and hide it so no one will find out what we did. She said that we have to go and leave really soon. I don't know how I can leave. I'm so tired all the time. But she said we have to soon because Dr. Freeman is going to put an ice pick inside my eye, just like that day on the stage. That scared me because she screamed really loudly and I don't want to hurt me any more than the circle treatment. She said she didn't want me to get the ice pick, so we have to leave. That's what she's going to take me far, far away, but I have to pick a new name so that no one knows who I was here at the hospital. I can't remember my full name, but I think I'm going to pick Margaret. I don't know why, but that is a pretty name. Mary said we're going to go real soon, so I have to go to sleep to get enough rest to go far away. P.S. I'm sorry I forgot my name, Mama. June 12th, 1918. My name is Mary Baker, and I am a nurse at Kings Park Psychiatric Hospital. I felt the need to complete 0724's diary so that whoever finds this can get a complete picture of the horrors that were done here. There was nothing mentally wrong with 0724. I knew it, and the doctors knew it, but her parents dropped her off here and we had to treat her like any other patient. That is, until Dr. Freeman came along. He said that 0724 was some sort of psychopath and needed to be dealt with. That's when he started to increase the frequency of hydrotherapy, 
and even threw in electroshock therapy. That poor little girl does not know what is happening to her, but she is the bravest girl I have met in my four years working at this dreadful place. I know that this is four years is a long time, but let me tell you, whoever finds this diary, what I did to help the patients here, every night I would take a look at the list of the next patient to undergo that terrible therapy that Dr. Freeman calls a lobotomy. It's monstrous if you ask me. I would look at which patient was next to receive the treatment and quietly slip into their room and kill them, make it look like an accident so no one suspected me, and silently save them from becoming the pawn in their own game. The patients call me the angel since I come every night at the same time and they've actually begun to scream when they see me walking the hallways. But no one has investigated it because all these kids are just crazy. I had to face the facts though. Death is preferable to living in a vegetative state, which is what most of them had become. And when I realized that 0724 was next on the list, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I decided we were going to escape. Her parents obviously didn't care about her. And I do. I'm taking her away and we'll live off the grid, change our names, move far away, and no one will ever know. No one will ever miss us. So whoever finds this and reads this, you know the facts. Mary Baker and whoever 0724 was no longer exist. I handed the diary off to Florence's family and I needed a good while to wrap my head around what had happened. Mary was an angel of death. She killed the patients that were going to be lobotomized because that's what she thought was the right thing to do. She left this journal for someone to find so that they can make amends for what she did. She couldn't keep it bottled up inside and couldn't stop and leave without saving Florence. So she just left and took Florence with her. I hope to God that Florence is safe and able to live out a happy childhood, but with Mary, I just don't know. A couple of months ago, I found a diary written by a young girl, Florence Blackwell, who was a patient at Kings Park Psychiatric Hospital on Long Island. Without me telling the entirety of her story all over again, there was one person who was instrumental in Florence's survival of the inhumane treatment of the hospital, a nurse named Mary. After doing some digging, Mary Baker seemed to be who Florence was talking about in her diary. While that is a semi-common name, I was able to do a little bit of digging into local genealogies and working into local historians. It looks like Mary Baker was aged 20 in 1918 when Florence was first admitted to Kings Park. She was fresh out of nursing school and still at an age where she should have been naive and optimistic about the world ahead of her. Mary Baker, however, at the age of 20, began killing juvenile patients at Kings Park Psychiatric Center as an angel of death. According to online sites and sources, an angel of death is a caregiver who abuses their power in such a way as to kill those that they are charged with looking over. In the past few years, there have been a couple cases in the news where nurses would assist in euthanizing elderly or terminally ill patients over and over again. If a nurse or doctor helped in the death of a patient more than once, they're officially classified as a serial killer in the eyes of the law and due to their angelic profession, normally dedicated to saving lives, they're dubbed an angel of death, keeping the angelic moniker but exposing them to what they were really doing. 20-year-old Mary Baker would steal away in the middle of the night and kill patients of the psychiatric hospital who were next on the list for an experimental lobotomy. At this time, the pioneer of modern lobotomy, Dr. Walter Freeman, was still in medical school and therefore not even medically cleared to be performing these operations. The children recognized the pattern of Mary's visits and they knew every night to expect her presence in the ghostly white nurse's uniform sneaking among them looking for her next victim. Mary ultimately stole away into the night with Florence in tow. They were going to make a life for themselves elsewhere. Thanks to the internet, the story of Florence and Mary was able to spread further than I had imagined. 
I'm thankful that the thousands of people were able to read and learn about Florence's life in the hospital, because if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. Since the story spread so quickly, I received a message from another user named Allie. I won't expose any of her personal information other than that. Allie actually didn't live too far from me, in the county of New York, just north of New York City. She said that she had read and sympathized with Florence's story and was talking to another group of friends and family members when her grandma stopped and her face went ghostly white. She asked Allie to clarify those dates in that hospital at least three times. And on the third time, after asking if her grandmother was okay, her grandmother Adrienne told her the following story. I have copied and pasted this exactly as Allie had transcribed the conversation for me. My mother had a younger brother growing up, and he was always so bright, she said. She said that he could solve any math problem in just a couple of seconds. He did well in school and was so smart, but he was also a little slow. I don't know if it was autism or what they'd call it these days, but all my mom told me was that he was slow and that was fine. We knew the gist of what she was getting at, but one day her brother Joseph just up and stopped talking. No one could get him to speak a word. And after a few months of trying to get Joseph to speak to them and to go on about his life, they gave up and put him in a mental hospital because, you know, that's what they did back then. They were living in Brooklyn at the time, running the restaurant, and he was put into Kings Park Hospital, the one from that story. Now I know what it was at the time. I was born in God the mid-40s, so I'm thinking this is probably right around the same time. It was probably the early 20s that all of this took place. Allie was stunned into silence, and for good reason. She sent me all of this over text message. Once we finally realized we had been speaking somewhere other than online forums, and she actually invited me to meet her grandmother up at the town. She said that there was a story from her grandmother that I needed to hear. So I shared my location with the family and all of my friends, and I geared up the car to head to upstate New York to meet Allie and her grandma. The location where Allie had me meet her and her grandma was quaint, albeit a little interesting. It was a small town right by the Hudson River, and it was adorable. Cute little homes all on the main street, and they were even having a farmer's market the day we decided to meet. But right outside of the heart of this town was a little park named Silesian Park. I got closer to my destination, and I noticed that it was definitely a town park. But in certain sections of the park, there were bricks and other posts that looked like it formed a building. There were mounds of unusually high dirt that didn't seem to fit in where the park was at all. But I figured maybe it was a quaint feature of this town. I eventually met Allie and her grandma, and we sat on the bench facing those mounds of dirt and exposed structural columns. I was the first one to break the awkward pleasantries and asked what exactly this park was. Allie looked at her grandma, and her grandma Adrienne nodded and said, I'll tell her, don't worry. She took a deep breath and started. So you probably know this park is called Silesian Park, right? You put it into your GPS on your phone to get here. So what you probably don't know is that up until about three years ago, this was actually a giant abandoned building sitting smack dab in the middle of town. Everyone saw it, everyone passed by it on their way to work, and yet no one really did anything about it. It was just kind of there, as if invisible. Now I don't know why all the history here, but I do know that I had an uncle, my mother's older brother Anthony, who went to school here. It was probably the mid-twenties or early thirties, and Anthony got sent up here out of city to go to school. He was always a bit of a troublemaker, so they put him into a Catholic school. One of these schools you sleep away at, and where the goal is to make you a priest one day. Now my mom and her brother passed away right away when Allie was a baby. And so that was probably, how old are you again? Oh, 19 years ago. Uncle Anthony passed away first, and gave something special to my mom. When she passed away, she gave it to me. I read through it once, but it never really meant anything to me so I tucked it away in a drawer as if something to look at when I missed my mom. After Allie told me about your story and those people, something hit me as familiar. I pulled out the journal from my sock drawer 
and I think your Mary worked at Salesian School with my brother. I was speechless. If what Adrienne was saying was correct, this could be a couple years after Mary and Florence had left Kings Park in the middle of the night. This would be absolutely the correct timeline for their escape. It would make sense that they hadn't gone far. They were a single woman and a young girl in their early 20s, and they wouldn't have gotten far without getting puzzled looks. I think you should borrow this for your research, Adrienne followed up. She had tears in her eyes and I had goosebumps on my skin, which she said her last sentence before excusing herself to the car. This story deserves to be told. I exchanged some pleasantries with Allie once her grandmother left, but I ran back to my car, cradling the journal like a baby. This couldn't be real. Had Mary actually written and kept a journal of her life outside of Kings Park? I told myself I was going to wait until I got home to read it, but I had a four hour drive ahead of me without factoring in New York City traffic. So I sat right there in my car, in the shadows of the abandoned Salesian school, and began reading. I'll post the update and the other entries as I read them later on. August 31st, 1925. Florence and I got incredibly lucky securing this job at this new school, and I'm told this was a private residence before turning it into a school as it is now. But that doesn't much matter to me. Florence and I aren't allowed most places, as their space is reserved only for men, or men within the Catholic Church. But that doesn't matter to me either. What matters is that Florence and I are safe, and we made it this far into our journey. Our last journal I've left behind is a memento of our time there, and I plan to do the same thing here. If I don't take them with us, I leave no hint of where we are going. We're untraceable. I am now the cook for the boys and the teachers of the Salesian school here. Florence, masquerading as my daughter, was allowed to board with me in the basement of the school, as long as she agrees to attend mass regularly. If that was the only stipulation for our safe harbor, Florence would go to Mass three times a day if needed. She whines and cries almost every night for her mama, and I have to constantly remind her that I am her mama now. There won't be anyone else. Not now. Not ever. September 3rd, 1925. Florence came running and crying into my arms today while I was fixing lunch for the boys. My friend, my friend James, she cried. He's gone. They found him in his bed this morning and his neck was turned all the way around. The priest said it has to be the devil coming to punish him, but James was the best boy I ever met. He even said we might get married once he graduates from this school. I pet her head softly and let her cry into my dress. Much as she had the first day I met her, I stroked her auburn ringlets and tilted her head up so I could meet her blue eyes. I told her that God and the devil work in mysterious ways, and we mustn't question what the priests are saying is true. We owe the priests our lives, and we will do what they say. She sniffed and nodded her head, and with permission, excused herself to the bedroom to almost undoubtedly continue her tears. I have to keep working with that girl. She has to understand. I am her caretaker. I am the only one looking out for her. No one will get in the way of me and my Florence. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to check out all the other videos on the channel and be sure to hit that like and subscribe button as it greatly helps out the channel. But as always, have a fantastic day and I'll see you in the next video.